right, roll in. Ready to record? Roll in. Wait, are we ready? Are we yes. Hi guys, hello? Hello? Oh, there we go. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the 155th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Before we get started tonight, if everyone could take a moment to silence their cell phones, that'd be greatly appreciated. Before we begin, we'd like to thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this space, as well as the space at Chelsea Market. We'd also like to take the time to thank Jeff Bates, Tom Lumoncelli, Jurgen Walston, Jared Brothers, Jimmy Kapowitz, and many other Googlers who've come out tonight and taken their time to help us make this possible. We'd like to thank our other uh, sponsors, including IBM, Canonical, Randor Group, as well as O'Reilly Media. If anyone is here is interested in sponsoring the New York Linux Users Group, please grab me or another officer at the end of the meeting. The New York Linux Users Group has been around for 13 years, and in those 13 years we've had monthly discussions on a wide variety of topics regarding Linux and open source technologies. Earlier this year we were recognized by the State of New York as a New York State educational not-for-profit. We're currently working on our organizational charter as well as attaining IRS 501c3 status. I'd like to just take a quick minute to thank some of the people at Nylog who've been at Nylog for a very long time and have helped made it happen, including Jim Gleason, Ron Gurren, Peter Norton, Mark Russell, Danny Rathjens, uh, Brian Gupta, Greg Levine. Additionally, uh, Rob Menace and David Bristow from the workshop are here and are also the ones running the camera tonight. If you'd like to reach out to the leadership team at Nylog, feel free to either grab me or an officer afterwards or email us at info at nylog.org. Once again, that's info at nylog.org. Also feel free to visit our website at www.nylog.org for more information about Nylog, our mailing list, and our IRC chat. Uh, at this time, does anyone have any announcements of meetings and events going on in New York City that they'd like to make aware to everybody else? Rob Venice. Good evening, everybody. Oh, sorry about that. And I protect. Anyway, um, I would like to take the time to announce um, Nylog's Hack Workshop, which meets every other Tuesday at the New York Public Library at 66 Leroy Street. Nearest train is the Houston Street 1 and the Christopher Street 1. Um, we meet every, we meet for two hours. We do hardware, software, Linux learning, whatever you wish. It's an open hack workshop. Come down, bring a project. We'll do anything you wish. You want to discuss anything? You want to teach anything to anybody? Feel free. It's that kind of a workshop. Anyway, back to Sunny. Actually, uh, Brian here is going to tell us of two more puppet events happening real soon. Okay, so in two weeks on Wednesday, March 21st, uh, Puppet NYC, which is a local Puppet user group, will be having a meeting at uh, Verizon. Um, there is a meetup group. If you're interested, you can just search Meetup for Puppet, and I'm sure you'll find it. Also, a uh, big event, April 27th. Uh, there's going to be the first New York Puppet Camp NYC. Uh, that's an all-day event on a Friday. Um, Eric will talk probably more a little bit about that when he gives his talk. Uh, also. The next Nylog meeting will be on WebOS, and we're going to have uh, a developer from uh, Hewlett Packard come in and talk about WebOS, which is a Linux-based uh, mobile operating system. Anybody else have any announcements or events they'd like to make? Um, just so you folks know, Lopsa and uh, from New York, New Jersey are sponsoring a conference, uh, the PIC conference. It's mostly sponsored by Lobster, New Jersey. But uh, it's May 11th and 12th. It's a small conference. Uh, it features training uh, for very reasonable cost. Uh, and then, it's this, I think. Are you speaking? I am speaking. Yes. Yeah. So Eric's one of the speakers, Pick, as well as others. Yes. Uh, and so you guys should look it up. It is PICCONF, P-I-C-C-O-N-F dot org. So you should go ahead and look that up. It's a very, actually, really useful conference. If you don't get a chance to go to things like Lisa or other assistive or Velocity, it's a pretty good opportunity to get pretty high quality training. I, I've heard one, wonderful things about an IPv6 talk that's happened previously, and yes. that alone is worth going to, apparently. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, two things right before we, uh, at the end of the meeting. One is we have a trivia giveaway. 
before we uh, have Eric here ask questions about Puppet, Linux, and anything but the Red Sox. Um, I don't know how many Puppet books are we giving away. I think that's up to you. I don't know. Uh, let's, 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 give away, let's give away 10 Puppet books. All right, we're going to away 10 Puppet books as well as a, a bunch of, or three uh, free PDF books from Riley Media. And uh, something Eric will talk a little bit more about will be meeting at the uh, Flannery's Irish Pub on the corner of 14th and 7th afterward for some beers. Without further ado, the New York Linux Users Group presents to you Eric Shamau, a professional services engineer at Puppet Labs. Tonight he'll be talking about SSH4 loops. <laughs> Come on, guys, it's good. <laughs> Eric here has been a uh, system administrator for 14 years now. He was actually very much involved with the Puppet community before he joined Puppet Labs about six months ago. He's worked on everything from big education to Wall Street. So without further ado, guys, Eric Shem Shema. I'm testing the voice mic. Is this working okay? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. So yes, SSH in a for loop. That's it. Go home. No more configuration then. Um, so you know, really briefly, let's talk about you know who am I, right? Who are you? Uh, why do we care about configuration management, and uh, and why do we care about DevOps, right? Because really, um, all of these tools in this space. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the configuration management space, you know there are a bunch of really popular tools. All of them are about facilitating communication. And at the end of the day, right, no particular tool is any better than the communication that you have inside of your organization. All they can do, and all they exist to do, um, is to sort of reinforce practices that, that, that you actually have to implement. Um, but we'll get to why you should trust me on that in a moment. Uh, so who am I? I'm a senior professional services engineer for Puppet Labs for all of six months. Um, but I was actually involved with Puppet for about two, two and a half years before that. So. Um, I do go back to the 0.24 days, um, which if you're using Debian, many of you are still in the 0.24 days. But uh, I'm a former operations manager and a recovering sysadmin. Um, so that, that really isn't like recovering in any other sense than uh, yeah, I don't have a pager anymore, which is just a wonderful feeling. Um, and I think um, you, know, you guys, with, with the aid of Puppet or tools like Puppet, should be unshackling yourselves. I think you know, we as a, as a profession have far too much um, accepted the fact that we're supposed to spend our nights like sweating about the fact that we're going to get woken up. And you know, we tend to sort of rationalize this as the fact that we're smart, responsible people, and we're the only ones that can do it, right? And yet, what we're really doing is sitting here, you know, just pushing buttons over and over again and getting woken up because somebody forgot to push the button or they pushed the wrong button during the day. And we can do better than this, and we should do better than this. Um, so and I need to shave an haircut, but that's, you know, that's sort of. So before we go there, uh, who are you? How many people in this room are actually using, uh, forget about Puppet, but some configuration management tool? Wow, nice. That, that, that is probably triple what you would have seen a year ago. In fact, let, let me ask that. How many people were using those configuration management tools a year ago? I am impressed. New York Live is impressed. <laughs> Um, okay, so of those, how many people are using Puppet as their configuration management tool? That's pretty nice. Um, yeah, so then uh, this talk may skew slightly basic for you guys. Uh, so I will, I will try and, and, and tech it up a bit, but I, I do need to keep um, some of the basic stuff for the people that don't have it. Uh, and I hope that, that this is useful to, to people that are Puppet folks. And uh, of course, we can, we can delve in with questions and answers later and hit on more stuff. So why do we care about configuration management, right? We've got these two demands in an organization, speed and stability, right? We've been asked to scale our server environments more and more and more, right? Every administrator is responsible for more and more systems. As managers start to decide that cloud means something that seemingly is meaningful to them, um, we're told that now you know, we have to be responsible for 100 servers per person, 200 servers per person, 1,000 servers per person. Um, and we don't scale, right? Not that well. Um, we, we do to a certain degree, but when something goes wrong, or when somebody does something at scale, it becomes a problem. And at the same time, we're being asked to deploy very quickly, right? Continuous, uh, continuous deployment, continuous integration, these things are a reality. There are organizations out there that are, that are doing you know, hundreds of deploys a week. Um, some of them are doing dozens of deploys a day, if not more. So that's become a reality, and the problem is that our organizations, whether or not they understand how those companies got to that reality, are demanding of us that we achieve it too. And so the question is, how do we get there? 
right? And we can't get there by extracting any more hours of productivity. I'm not saying that everybody in this room is working to his or her capacity, but the reality is that like working harder is not going to solve the problem. We're, we're generally, as a profession, pretty hard workers. Um, so I, I think, you know, although it's a cliche, the old work smarter, not harder thing actually does apply here. We have to find another approach. We have to find another way to do this. So what is Puppet? Puppet's a configuration management framework. Right? It's a language that you use to describe your systems. And it's also a policy enforcing system. Right? So the idea is um, Puppet fundamentally, um, well, we'll go back to that in a second. Puppet fundamentally is, is not a distributed scripting language. And that's why the SSH in a for loop thing is a joke. We actually have a shirt that says, you know, because SSH in a for loop isn't enough. Um, you know, the reality is that's how we've all been administering for a long time. And the problem is that, you know, when you go and take those sort of tools and push them out to that degree, um, what we're really doing is scaling our own failures, right? So if we screw up an SSH script and we run it in cluster SSH against a thousand nodes, that is an enormous screw up, right? And it took us 30 seconds to do and it is going to take us two weeks to undo, right? So what we really need is some kind of system that's going to enable us to define what a successful system looks like, right? So that we can then deploy and test whether or not we have successfully made a successful system without actually having to sit there and type all the commands ourselves. So before we go too much deeper into it, you know, who used Puppet? Yeah, who doesn't? Um, it, it, it is, you know, certainly, um, if not the market leader, then, then certainly well ahead um, in terms of adoption. Pretty much every major company that I can think of, uh, you know, major banks and uh, uh, publishing companies, uh, stock exchanges, you know, Pu Puppet is extremely ubiquitous. Uh, in fact, it, it's incredibly easy to find people who know Puppet. And if you're wondering how, how well the penetration of this has gone, uh, the uh, NSA distributes for a long time, has distributed its Linux desktop hardening guidelines. They now distribute them in two formats. You can get them as a PDF, and you can get them as a Puppet manifest. Which also, by the way, means that the NSA uses Puppet internally, which we know. Um, so, old school system administration, right? Let's, let's agree on some points here. You're not gonna finish the wiki, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I know you're on like revamp number three, you've got all the pages into a nice tree, but it ain't gonna happen because you're gonna have new stuff and it's not going to make it. Fundamentally, you know, not to say that the process of documentation is worthless, it's not. Documentation is extremely important and I don't mean to deride it in any way through this, right? But the reality is that, you know, we're waiting for extremely busy sysadmins who are trying to do things to document the things they did after the fact. That is always going to come second to getting done the next emergency that landed in their plate. And while you may realize the value of documentation, if all of the people working with you don't, the wiki's not going to work. Okay? Um, and yeah, if you just send out notifications when you made a change, if they were going to start reading them, they would have done that already. Um, you can keep trying to twist their arms and make the notifications very exciting and multicolored, and they'll just filter them out. Um, you know, the reality is there's a certain amount that we can do about people, and there's a certain amount to which, you know, do you yourself actually read out in full every email sent out by every person on your team about every change they made to your systems, and then do you sit there afterwards and think about that email and wonder to yourself what kind of impact their change is going to make on your systems? Do you then sit down and log in and investigate some of those changes, or do you go, oh yeah, that looks cool, move on? Probably the latter, especially if there's beer, right? So, sort of, you know, uh, descending directly from the second one, you're either getting too many alerts or you're not getting enough alerts, right? So most people's monitoring systems are not well configured. If your monitoring system is well configured, there's probably a lot of extra stuff happening on your network that doesn't fit into any sort of scheduled paradigm. Right? There's all sorts of events happening, and those generate alerts. So what happens is, you know, you get all these alerts, and eventually, again, just like the notifications, this just becomes a dull roar. You start to ignore it, you filter it, you look past them, maybe you scan, you know, if you're very responsible, you open them up and you scan them, right, you know, to see if they look serious. But again, you're not getting on that box and logging in, and you couldn't, right? There isn't enough time in the day to do this. Or you've suppressed all that by putting your monitoring systems at, you know, five-minute intervals and checks, and then you're going, I don't get any alerts. That's because you don't know about it, right? So there are other ways to do this stuff. Um, and there are other configuration management tools than Puppet. 
Uh, so here's why we don't really use them, right? So the pros of using old system, uh, of other systems are they feel natural, they feel comfortable. A lot of them work the same way that, uh, that you know, our existing systems do, big scaled out shell scripts that we feel comfortable about and can hack together quickly and can distribute and maybe written in a language that we're familiar with. So that's awesome because they're like old school tools, you know, taken to the next level, right? And they allow us to scale quickly, those alternate tools, because we know the language, we understand how they work, we're familiar with working with them, maybe we already have scripts that will happily plug into them. And so we feel, well, this is fantastic. But here's the problem, all right? If you keep doing things the way you've been doing them, you're not getting any new insight into your systems. You're not looking at your systems in a different way. You're not changing the way that you're managing them. Right? You're just trying to scale what you're doing now out to a bigger level. Well, think about it. You're not happy about what you're doing right now. The problems are killing you. And as you scale what you do right now out to a bigger level, the problems are scaling too. Right? And so what ends up happening is that the problems scale faster than the systems do. Because it really doesn't take very long to deploy 100 systems. But it takes a lot of time to fix 100 systems. So again, this is scaling faster than us. And we're not meeting the demands. And now people are saying in your company, well, Netflix has no operations team. How are you managing it? So why does Puppet solve this? Right? Puppet has three critical things. And I would say that those three are almost one, but they're all related. First of all, Puppet is fundamentally declarative. And I think this is something that tends to very much confuse people who download Puppet and start playing with it. And I think we as a company can sort of take the blame for for not having done a good enough job, certainly initially, uh, of sort of waving the banner on this and telling people like, hey, you know, yes, download Puppet, it's easy, it's cool, but oh, by the way, you need to know this. When you read Puppet code, and we'll take a look at some Puppet code later, but when you read Puppet code, it's sort of like, and, and my, the people in my company will shoot me for saying this, but it's sort of like looking at an XML document. I know that makes everybody so thrilled. Yes, XML is gonna fix all your problems. It's 1995 again. Um, but in reality, when you look at an XML document, right, you don't read it top to bottom. An XML document is a representation of a bunch of objects, right, which happen to be organized top to bottom on a piece of paper because there's not much else we can do with a piece of paper. But their order is not critical, right? They're objects. We look at them independent of each other. The same thing is true for Puppet. Puppet is not procedural. It is not a scripting language. I cringe when people say that they wrote a Puppet script. Okay? Because it's not a scripting language. It's not designed to say, do this, then do this, then do this. Can you do that in Puppet? Yes, there are mechanisms for doing it. But it is not how you should mostly approach stuff in Puppet. Puppet is a system, it is a framework for describing your systems. Right? You're saying, forget about how to install Apache. Right? Because you're only going to install Apache once on the box. Right? But you're going to need to maintain Apache forever and upgrade it forever. Right? So the real question is, what will my install look like when it's successful? Because that's what we want to know, right? What will it look like when it's successful? Is it successful now? If not, how do I fix it? That's what we really care about, right? Not the procedural script that we've been shipping around that says, well, here's how to install Apache, which tells you nothing about what to do if that process fails, right? So second of all, Puppet is item potent. Um, you'll see that word float around a lot. It's not my favorite word in the world, but I use it because you're going to see it in, the, in the, uh, the information about Puppet. And what that means is uh, you can keep running Puppet over and over and over again. And if your resources haven't changed, Puppet won't change them. Okay? In other words, Puppet is safe to be run against a resource multiple times, and it will not change the state of the resource unless that state diverges from what you expected, in which case it will put it back. And really related to the former two, Puppet is really focused on what with a lesser focus on how. Puppet wants to know what your system looks like. And to a lesser degree, you can say, how do I make my system look like that? So what does item potency mean? Right? We've got a script here. right? And with a script, we say, let's run service sshd stop. OK, service sshd stopped. Let me run my script again. Service sshd stopped. Crap, output was different this time. Okay, in Puppet, if I say Puppet resource service SSHD ensure stopped, it'll say, it stopped. If I do it again, it'll say, yeah, the resource was stopped. Success. Your resource is in the state that you've defined. You told me you wanted SSH to be stopped, 
SSH has stopped. Which one of these is more useful to you? Do you actually care about the procedure itself, or do you care that the service SSHD is in the status that you define? Tell me what you want, right? This is, I'll, I'll bet, something you all say to your users over and over again. Don't tell me how to do what you want me to do. Tell me what you want, and I, right? And I'll help you figure out how to get there, right? And yet we're sitting here doing the same thing to computers. And the thing is that, you know, just like you're good at different stuff than the people who need you to configure their servers, your computers are good at different stuff than you're good at, right? Human beings are very good at analytical skills. We're very good at taking a look at things and drawing inferences and figuring things out. Computers are very lousy at that. But what they're fantastic at is repeating things over and over again and checking things. But we insist on putting ourselves in the position of doing things over and over again and then analyzing the results instead of saying, wait a minute, let me define what I want this to look like and say, screw it, let the computer determine whether or not it is. And I guess that's really another way of saying you are what you admit. Why do we long for stable systems? We keep creating unstable ones. We keep creating these bang together shell scripts that we wrote at like 7 p.m. on Friday because we desperately needed to get out of work that don't really work right and then we ship them into production and then we're shocked when like three months later they result in like the all weekend miserable session. Um, it doesn't have to be this way, but we're creating that for ourselves. So when we say we want to get something into a desired state, what does that mean? Your scripts will say, you know, okay, we're installing Apache, right? So let's add the user, right? And then we'll install HTTPD, and then we'll do make your dash p var dub dub app, right? And we do all of this. What happens when you fail in one of those steps? How does that script recover? So, okay, are you gonna build all kinds of error checking into your script? Are you gonna tool around it? Okay, cool. Um, who's checking those tests, right? Are you running unit tests against those tests? I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, if you're acting like a developer, then you should probably talk to your dev team, right? And ask them how they check their things. And you'll find out that they have a rigorous process for putting things through QA. And you may think they release buggy software, but they put a lot of work into this, right? And we don't. We hack together scripts like no tomorrow, right? So you're much better off doing what you're good at, really, and saying, hey, I'm going to describe my application. I want this user. I want this package. I want these files. Let the, the, tool fr the, the framework, the tooling that you have already, determine whether or not it's there. So talking a little bit you know, more technically about how Puppet works. Um, Puppet sort of operates on the node basis. Um, we're getting a little better at operating on the application cluster basis. And it's one of the areas that we're, we're chiefly trying to work on. But right now, sort of the fundamental element of a Puppet manifest right, is a node. And the node, uh, which is defined by its fully qualified domain name, uh, can have any number of different roles. Right? We can assign, we can basically build these little manifests that contain a, a, you know, a, a description of what a successful Apache server looks like, what a successful MySQL server looks like. Right? And we can start to put these things together and assemble or compose right, a node definition that looks like what we want our server to look like. So how do we do that? Um, well, the very base level of understanding about a node is factor. Factor is sort of the, uh, the base level DNA of Puppet. And what factor is, is a binary that runs on your system. And by the way, you can install factor independent of Puppet if you've got Ruby somewhere, you can install it with a gem, but, but don't use gems. Um, so you can probably get it as a, as a package from your distribution. Uh, if you're, uh, yeah. So um, factor basically returns all sorts of information about your system as key value pairs. Right? And all factor is is a, a, a folder full of tiny little scriptlets. And each scriptlet runs and asks something of your system. Now, those scriptlets are written in Ruby, or at least the ones that are, that are uh, released by Puppet are. But fundamentally, you can call out to any scripting language or any compiled application you want. Okay? So Factor is able, able to be easily customizable and immediately make available to Puppet any kind of information you want about the system that you're running on in some form of key value pair. On the flip side, we've got this concept of functions. Functions execute on your Puppet master. And we'll kind of get into infrastructure in a little bit, but for now, assume that you've basically got a you know, centralized Puppet server Right, that's controlling a bunch of nodes. And that server is your puppet master. So on that server, you can execute functions. Right? And those can do things like perform complex computation, uh, reach out to database servers, right? go do lookups in LDAP, or do other sorts of things. Um, and one of the, the chief advantages of functions 
um, and one of the advantages of Puppet over some of the competitors is that it avoids your nodes needing to talk to those centralized resources. You know, again, if you push that logic and that decision making out to the node level, right? If your servers are running scripts to install stuff, think about what's happening here. Every server that you do this on needs to be able to talk back to that database server in order to figure out, well, gee, what role am I? What information do I need from that database server? Every server that's out on your edge, if you have some complex computation, has to perform that computation. Is that actually what you want your Apache nodes in your DMZ doing? Do you want to punch that many holes in your firewall? Are you paying for EC2 large instances so that they can go do this sort of stuff? Right? So the idea of centralizing this makes a great deal of sense. And again, just like functions, these are customizable. You can drop these in a directory right, and access them anywhere. You can call these functions, and they'll basically go and pull out some information. So, so far, we have two ways of getting information into Puppet. Right? We've got facts, which run on the node, right, and collect information and return it back to the Puppet Master. And we've got functions that run on the Puppet Master and go out and collect information. Next, we've got manifests. Right? So we've talked a little bit about, about how manifests uh, are assembled. We basically define a bunch of resources that we want to manage. In this case, we've got SSH. We say we want the SSH package to be present. Right? And we have an SSHD config that we want to be there. And we've got an SSHD service that we want to make sure is running. And by the way, this is valid puppet code. Um, you could take this and stick it on a server and it will work. Um, presuming you've got an SSHD config sitting around somewhere. Um, so the manifests are sort of the third piece of this whole business. And this is the bit that you provide, right? The information about, OK, what do I want this thing to look like at the end of the day? So we take all of those things, the results of the facts, the output of the functions, and the manifest that we've written. And from that, we build a catalog. So when you think about what's happening, right? when we actually do a puppet run, puppet runs on a node. It collects all this information from factor. It ships that information back to the puppet master. The puppet master then runs, looks through your manifests, runs any functions that are called within those manifests, takes that with the results of the facts, and builds it together into something which is a static representation of what your server is supposed to look like. That's an incredible amount of flexibility that it gives you. right? Because you now have something. You now have a document that describes exactly what your server is supposed to look like. From a, from a security perspective, there's really nothing to worry about now because when you ship that out to a host, if somebody were to compromise that end node, you're really not losing anything more than they have by looking at the node. It's just a description of what the node looks like. right? So there's no security disadvantage in distributing this catalog. But what it gives you is something to compare against. It gives you your idealized state for this node. And now on a resource by resource basis, you can go through and take a look at this node and say, does the node in its current state match what I think it's supposed to look like? That's something that no other tool on the market provides. That's how come we have a no-op mode. Um, and that's why our no-op mode works. Right? So the idea is we can actually go through, run, and then say, hey, you know what? If this resource isn't in sync, if this resource doesn't look the way it's supposed to, my company's not quite ready for me to clobber the changes that get done in an ad hoc way yet. But I would like to send out a nasty email. Um, we can certainly do that, right? Or you can, you know, certainly lots of financial institutions will sit there and run all week in no-op mode, right? They have like a Saturday morning change window. They'll sit there all week and run in no-op mode and collect reports of the changes that were made and then go through and say, which ones of these do I want to accept and put into Puppet and which ones do I want to blow away on Saturday? But at least they're aware of what the picture is in a large way. So let's get a little bit more into, uh, actually, I. I should, uh, well, no. Let's get a little bit more into, into sort of what these resources look like inside the manifest. So this is a resource declaration. Um, and we saw a couple slides back, you know, an example of one, right? In the very simplest sense, we have package SSH, right? So we're defining that this is a resource of type package. Its name is SSH, right? We've got an ensure statement, which simply says ensure present. We could say ensure a particular version number. We could say ensure latest, right? And what Puppet does is it basically operates through a resource abstraction layer. Puppet goes to a particular host, and it says, OK, for this type, for the package type, let me call factor and see what kind of system I'm on. OK, I'm on a Red Hat system. Therefore, my default provider is yum. You haven't over uh, overridden that by saying, hey, use RPM or 
I'm a lunatic and I've installed AppGet on my Red Hat system. So, um, you know, since you haven't done any of those things, I'm going to use yum and I'm going to call yum to install the SSH package, and boom, we're done. Right? So we've got one command that will work in the same way across multiple systems. And you can get much more complex in terms of choosing which kinds of package names and which versions per system. It's a good simple example. So coming back here, we take a look at the, the basic syntax. Anybody can do this. This is really straightforward, right? We've got type and a title. We've got some name variable, whether it's path or name or, or uh, you know, with a title again. We're going to ensure that it's present. We've got some other attribute that's set to true when we, we accept booleans, and some other attribute that's set to a string value. This is extremely readable. Did anybody in this room actually have trouble figuring out what this does? Right? Any sysadmin who's familiar with Linux can understand this right at the surface. And so even if, even if you're not comfortable writing Puppet, your team can immediately come in and take a look at Puppet and understand what it is. I have a colleague that refers to Puppet as executable documentation. And I think that's a, that's a great description of it. You know, not to say that documentation isn't worth it, because you haven't told me why you want these things. You haven't told me why this SSHD config, or why this user's root, right? That's a whole separate area of documentation. But what you have told me is told me what. This is what my server should be looking like. If my server doesn't look like this, I have a problem. That's really what 99% of the wiki stuff we're missing is. It all tells us this was the procedure two years ago before all the verbal stuff that we hacked, right? And then we like try and figure out what like the delta was, right? All we really care about is like what is success, and and maybe some hints about how to get there. So uh, in this particular case, right? Uh, this is actually the same slide as before. Um, you could do a little bit more with this SSH example because this is a little bit naive. We talk about you know, uh, Puppet not caring about order, right? Puppet not being a script. Every resource in Puppet being you know, evaluated independently. The problem is that doesn't always really work, right? If we try and evaluate these three resources in any order, we could have a serious problem. If we haven't yet installed OpenSSH server and we try to evaluate the SSHD service first, um, we're going to fail, right? So Puppet does actually provide you with a way to chain resources together. And you've got the concept of, of require and before statements and subscribe and notify statements. So the idea is you can say, hey, this service requires this package. Subscribe is even more powerful. Subscribe says, hey, if you've updated this thing that I've subscribed to, kick me, send me a message, and let me execute what we refer to as our refresh command. So for a service, Puppet knows, okay, by default, refresh is execute service blah restart. Right? You can override that and say, that's not what I want you to do when we hit refresh. But by default, that's generally the right behavior. Right? So if I have, in this particular example, um, let's see if I can find a quicker one. On this particular example, I'll have package SSH, right? and I'll have this config file, which I don't want to drop until the SSH package is there. Because if I drop the file first, and then I drop the package over it, we're going to overwrite the file that we're trying to manage. Right? So we can do some dependency chaining. And then we say that service is going to subscribe to the file. So what that says is, if this file changes, restart this service. Now, in a normal world, most of the time, you're not installing SSH, and you're not upgrading SSH. So the order in which these get evaluated isn't really that important. But the few times in which you are doing that sort of thing it is, this allows you to nail it down. In other words, the assumption of Puppet is that for the most part, you're checking your resources to see that they look in the appropriate state. But where necessary, you can inject some hints to make sure that we're doing the right thing. We do provide some shorthand to do this kind of thing, and there's a bunch of syntax around this that, that makes it a lot easier. We do occasionally get some flack for the fact that you know, people feel that our, our, uh, our manifests become a lot of require and before statements and subscribe and notify statements. But the reality is that there are so many implicit requirements. For instance, if I have a file that's owned by a user, and I'm managing that user elsewhere in Puppet, there is an implicit dependency that's built between those two things such that the user is always processed first. Right? And you can really take that a long way. If I have a file that's being managed in Puppet, the parent file, any parent uh, folder of that file will automatically be processed first. So the number of require and before and subscribe statements is pretty limited from a logical perspective. Right? You only have to put it in where it isn't obvious. If you don't put it in, right, if you're running some kind of system that doesn't require you to do these things, you're not making those dependencies go away. 
You're masking them by executing in a particular order. You're not documenting the fact that this file requires this package to be present before you can do something with it, right? That's not actually dealing with the problem. That's just kicking the problem further down the road. So Puppet, in a lot of ways, forces you to sort of deal with the reality of your systems. And that is an uncomfortable reality sometimes to face because we're often thrown things that we don't understand fully. We're put into an environment where we don't understand what a server is supposed to look like. But you know, we should understand what that server looks like. And in the process of writing a puppet manifest, we come to understand what that server is supposed to be. And in doing that, not only are we improving our management of those servers, we're improving our own understanding of them. The process of puppetizing something, when I, when I ran my operations team, I would teach them new servers by having them puppetize the installation. Go look at this box, build me a puppet manifest that makes a box that looks like this one. In doing that, they've got to read all the wiki dots, they've got to look at the packages that are installed, and at the end of that process, they're going to understand something about what, what this server does in a far more deep way than somebody that glanced at a wiki page. So after we've done all of these things, when we build the catalog, what Puppet actually builds is a resource graph. You can generate a resource graph directly from the command line in Puppet by executing it with a dash dash graph on it. And what you get is something like this. Now, this is only a small part of a resource graph, um, but you can certainly, um, you, you'll have many more resources, right? But what you do is you go through and delete the ones you're not interested in. If you've got a particular problem that's confusing you, you just delete the resources you don't care about and look at the ones that are particularly vexing you, right? So in this particular case, we can very quickly visualize exactly what we're looking at. We have a MySQL package, right? Um, we have a package MySQL server, which we say is executed after MySQL package. Uh, and it looks here as though we have actually a cyclical dependency, uh, which dash dash graph is really good at catching. So if we've got something that says this needs to be before this, and yet it needs to be after something else that needs to be before the first thing, and we've created a loop, Puppet will help us find it. And the dash dash graph option can help you zoom in on that kind of thing. But more importantly, what it says is, the Puppet Master understands what your server is supposed to look like, and so do you. We do have a way around um, sort of the, the, the uh, procedural uh, question of like, well, what do I do when I'm managing Oracle, right? There's nothing I can do about the fact that in order to interact with Oracle, I have to issue some scripts. I have to issue some commands. Oracle does not make it easy for me, right? I can't just interact with an API. I actually have to do something. And so we do provide an exec command that lets you call out shell scripts and binaries. But you know, fundamentally, the idea is that we then provide a whole bunch of meta parameters, creates only if, unless, refresh only. All of these things allow us to specify conditions in which we do or don't want to actually evaluate the shell command that we're looking at. In other words, we take the fundamentally procedural command that we've got, this thing that we've got to deal with and can't get around, and we wrap it in a declarative wrapper. So the idea is, right, in a very simple case, we can exec out to the shell. In a more complex case, just having an unless or an only if statement or something like that isn't going to help us, right? So in that circumstance, we can actually go out and build a defined resource. A defined resource lets you take puppet code and bundle it together, sort of like a C struct object, right? To build sort of an extension to puppet, entirely written in puppet code. We still don't know how to be a programmer, right, to be able to do this. And finally, if we're in our most complex case, we can actually write a provider. Providers are written in Ruby, right? And they allow you to really extend Puppet. So if you've got something that absolutely requires you to do some crazy stuff with somebody's API, you can go ahead and build a provider, which allows you to then go and execute the checks and tests necessary to make sure that you can do three things, okay? Can I check the state of a current object? Can I create that object? Can I destroy that object? If I can do those three things, I can meet all the needs of Puppet, right? Because I can make sure that something is in a certain state. If it's not, I can turn it into that state. And if it is, I can leave it alone. And if I've been asked to remove it, I can remove it. Uh, I'm gonna skip past some of the testing stuff just because we didn't start late today. Um, you can also pull data into Puppet, a whole bunch of interesting ways. One of the most interesting is Hira. Um, and for those of you that are using Puppet that aren't using Hira, Hira is sort of a replacement for EXT Lookup. How, how many people in here are actually using EXT Lookup in Puppet? Yeah. <laughs> how many people are using Hira? We got one. Start using Hira. Google it. Um, 
Pyra is a tool for, for looking up data in a hierarchical data store. It allows you to specify any number of backends. So you're not locked into using Hyra to store your data, but Hyra lets you look up your data and sort of specify how you want to get at a particular piece of data for a particular node. So what it allows you to do is say on a parameter by parameter basis, I'm going to fold down a hierarchy, right, and I'm going to say, okay, at the, at the region level, have I said what I want my DNS server to be? No. Okay, at the rack level, have I? No. Okay, at the application server level, have I? Oh, okay, this type of application server is supposed to talk to this DNS server? Fine, that's my DNS server. Hyra sort of facilitates building those type of hierarchies and storing your data there. So, basically, what Puppet allows you to do is start to develop a method for developing your, your infrastructure in a way that's very similar to the way that developers build code, right? We're going to sit here and we're going to put our stuff into version control. I don't know why that's great. Put our stuff into version control, right? Develop modules, test them, right? Then sit there with a tool like Vagrant or Fission to run VMware or VirtualBox on our local system or KVM if you've got a local you know, Linux box, uh, and go ahead and test those in a standalone mode. You can use things like Puppet environments to go test them against a live Puppet server without affecting real live active boxes. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that you can do to actually verify that this code that you're writing is going to look right in production. And the idea is you start to get into a workflow. This looks a lot like you know, dev QA UAT model that we put developers through. Right? And the idea is that we can actually validate that our code is doing what it's supposed to do, that our systems look the way that they're supposed to look. So how do you get help? Um, because invariably, you, know, you start using Puppet and you get, a certain, you get to a certain point and then you need to sort of reach out for some help. And one of the great things about Puppet is we have an enormous community. Um, first of all, not enough people are on the Puppet user's mailing list, and I say that despite the fact that we have like over, I think, 4,000 people on Puppet users right now. But people don't leverage it enough. Ask questions, right? Get on the mailing list and ask questions. Um, there's also Puppet Dev. If you're involved in writing Ruby code that interacts with Puppet or extending Puppet, that mailing list is quite useful. Pound Puppet. Pound Puppet's amazing. Uh, in, in IRC, it's in Freenode. Um, and there's just a tremendous community of people, including, by the way, all of us who aren't on the road. So when I'm not doing this sort of thing, you know, when I'm sitting in the home office, uh, I'm logged into Pound Puppet and we answer questions, and so are most of the dev team. And of course, docs.puppetlabs.com. Um, our documentation's getting better. We have a, a, you know, a couple of new doc guys. We're actually bringing them up to speed. We were a very small company with bad docs. We're getting better at it. Um, but all of these things are places that you can go for help. Uh, and I should note that not only are we helping, and not only are we hired developers right, uh, and documentation guys, but we're hiring. Right? So if you guys are particularly interested, go check out the site. Even if you don't think that you're a great fit, right, go and drop your resume in the, in the job score thing and say what sort of things you'd like to do. We're still small enough that if you match what it is that we'd like to do, even if a job isn't necessarily posted, we may find a place for you. Right? So if you have any question at all, Give it a try. What's the worst thing that can happen? You'll, you'll get to meet some nice people. Um, so before I, I uh, move on to the next bit of this, I guess let me ask, let me open this up to, to questions. Does anybody have questions? I have microphones. I have microphones, but ah, yeah. Perfect. Hi, Jeff. Um, so you were talking about Hira versus external lookups and all that stuff. Um, so right now I'm using LDAP to classify hosts and groups of hosts. Uh, how does Hira interact with that, or what would you recommend along those lines? Um, so you know, I definitely recommend for for those that aren't familiar with the concept. But how many people in here that are Puppet users are using an external node classifier? Okay, how many people know what an external node classifier is? I'm going to explain it. Um, so an external node classifier is basically when you start working with Puppet, um, you declare individual servers, individual nodes in Puppet the same way that you declare uh, resources. When you looked at that manifest and we had package SSH, right, user whatever, well you have node myhost.localland.whatever, right? And you start listing information about the node. That doesn't scale very well. So pretty quickly people start putting their resources in something like you know, LDAP or uh, a variety of other things. And you can basically very easily write an external node classifier. Um, 
The documentation for how to do it is pretty good. If you take a look at the results of, of an external load classifier, all it returns is some real simple YAML. Right? It's just a list of the classes that are going to be put on this server and a list of key value pairs that are going to be uh, sent over to this server. And in fact, if you've downloaded the Puppet demo, uh, the, the Puppet Enterprise uh, free license copy, um, if you take a look, it uses dashboard as an external load classifier. So you can actually go and run the ENC script. If you look in PuppetConf, it'll say like node terminus, right? and it gives a path to a script. You can go run that script with a host name after it and see what the external load classifier would return for that particular host. So what he's using is LBAC, right, to store that information. Uh, what Hydra does is basically allow you to store that information in a variety of other places. It basically provides a, a connector, right, if you're looking at it co-op. So there's a couple ways that you can use Hydra. You could actually use Hydra as an external load classifier and go say, I'm going to hook this up to my CMDB or my deployment system or whatever else you're using for inventory. Right? and say, I'm going to fetch information out of there. Uh, if that's not what you want to do, another thing that you can do is basically define your own data store. Right? So you could either use YAML or MySQL or whatever you'd like, right? and front end it with Hira and say, um, just I'm going to do a normal node definition, but then I'm going to pick up the classes or pick up the variables from Hira. And <clears throat> what that really gives you is the ability to say, if I'm going to take this host and I'm going to locate it in a hierarchy somewhere, right? Now I know that this host is in the East Coast. I know that it's in my, you know, my uh, uh, New York colo, right? I know that it's in the uh, the Tomcat app server area, and I know that this is a front end web server. So based on all these things, these are the classes that I want to arrive, right? And I can go at each step of that hierarchy and pick out those particular attributes, right, from each level, and I can either say, hey, I reached the first one, stop. This is the array of classes I want, or I can say aggregate all the way down, and when I hit the very bottom, give me the whole list that you've discovered. That's basically how Hira would help ENC functionality, because you don't have to sit there. Right now, you've got a problem where you have to kind of define these meta classes, right? So you say, you know, <clears throat> I've got Apache, and then I don't typically just install Apache on a server, right? I want to install, like, you know, Apache plus, like, my, uh, my firewall, you know, uh, package and a bunch of other stuff. And so you create these composite classes, and all they do is include other classes, and then you put those in nodes. Um, Hira kind of helps you with that problem, because instead of defining meta classes, you position a node where it belongs in your hierarchy, and it automatically inherits the, the classes that you're looking for. So does that? Uh... Yeah, that perfect. Cool. Um, other questions? <laughs> no questions on Anybody the else? <laughs> I can go right to the trivia. Yeah. Good job. Ah. Okay, there's a, okay, there, and like that is on the blue. You're not, uh, you need to. Yeah. Uh, the slide on execs, uh, just because there's a long transition period between the old way and the new way. Yes. Uh, there's two things in particular you talked about. One is wrapping that shell script so that it has cleaner and or nicer output uh, according to how Puppet wants to run it for you. Uh, and the other is not writing a resource yet using Puppet, the Puppet language, uh, to get the job done. Uh, could you expand on that just a little bit? I'm, I... Yeah, sure. No, no, that, that's a pretty common one. So let me, let me hop back to that slide just to, because it's, it's a good framework to work from. Um, so exec you know, works like most other resources in that you know, if I say, hey, I'm going to exec bin ls, right? I'm going to run then bin ls. Um, however, and that's actually the command attribute, right? But you can specify a bunch of other meta parameters around it. So for instance, creates. Creates lets you specify a file that that process is going to create. And if that file is present, don't execute this particular exact statement. Now, the kind of loophole with creates is that um, it doesn't actually have to be true. So like your process doesn't actually have to create that file, right? You just have to say it does. So you can use this to sort of implement a lock file, right? If I want to say that I want you to run, you know, update DB and that creates the mlocate database, um, then I can say, you know, that this creates a file in my home directory called don't run mlocate. And if that's there, right, then don't run it. And if it is there, I'm sorry, if it is there, don't run it. If it's not there, you know, go ahead and run update db. And of course, that condition will always fail unless I create that lock file, so that exec will always be run. 
You can also add to it things like uh, the only if or unless uh, attributes. So what those say is they'll allow you to run a shell command right, and evaluate the output of that shell command. And based on that particular output, you can then say, you know, should I or should I not run this exec statement? So an example would be, um, let's say that I have an exec where I need to create a database. And so there's, a, there's a, a, an Oracle command that lets you go and initialize a database. And you say, well, OK, I want to put this in Puppet, but this is now very bad because I don't want to keep creating the database over and over again, even though I know it's like in theory safe, right? Like we're getting error messages in our Puppet output, and there's the danger that like if something's gone wrong, I'm going to overwrite something. How do I handle this? And the answer is, you know, only if or unless, right? So you could say unless, and that lets you specify another shell command. And that second shell command can be a query out to the Oracle Database Manager to find out whether that database exists already. So that unless command will always get executed, right? But the command, if that returns true, right, then the exec itself won't go. So this allows you to put a little bit of a safety measure in place. And only if is basically the same, but in reverse, right? So it's if this returns true, then execute it. If it returns false, then don't. So for instance, I could say only execute my create database command if I grip my mount table and make sure that my database partition is mounted. Otherwise, don't, right? And that's a type of, you know, the sort of condition that I've done that to myself, right? You stick in some exec statement and it's an rsync or something and you rsync and you didn't check that something was mounted because this isn't a real resource, right, in the sense that it's not connected to anything. And, uh, and so you fill up a drive. So you might want to say, you know, only if the drive space is available. You can actually check available space, df-k. You know, if, it, if that, and use test, if that matches some condition you want, don't execute the command. And, you know, lastly here, and there's actually more metaparameters that you can attach to this, but refresh only says, you know, don't run this command unless I've subscribed to some other object or I've set some other object to notify me, right? Um, unless I get a notification from that other object, don't run me, right? So this is sort of useful for an exec that you don't want to run unless, for instance, let's say you're, you're updating your syscontrols, right? So you might drop a new syscontrol.conf. You don't want to execute your syscontrol import command, right? Unless that syscontrol.conf changed. So you would subscribe this exec to that file. If the file changes, import the new commands and you know, stick the stuff in your, in your kernel. If not, hey, there's no reason to run this again. Does that, does that sort of help answer? I, I lost where the original speaker was. There you are. Can you, can you thumbs up, awesome. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, so if Thanks, Danny. If I'm new to Puppet, when it gets started, uh, let's say I have a server, and when a Linux server get Puppet to describe that server and then clone it, make another server that's just like the first one. Can you give me like a rough overview of how I might go about doing that? Uh, so uh, let me just repeat the question because that was a little. Uh, so uh, the question was, um, if we want to clone a server, right? We want to get started with Puppet. We're new, um, and we want to take a look at an existing server and sort of duplicate that server in Puppet, you know, as quickly as possible, uh, so that we can, you know, have something else that roughly looks like it. Um, so the, the answers to that are, are, are not as great as I would love them to be. That's actually a space that we're, we're really actively working in. Because getting a description of a system is not as easy as it looks. And, and the easiest way for me to show that is to actually show it. So let me, let me pull something up and kind of demonstrate why here. You can all yell at me for using RVM later. Everybody see that okay? So Puppet, um, I mentioned that Puppet has a resource abstraction layer, right? And normally that resource abstraction layer is accessed through, uh, through the Puppet commands, right? So you can go and write a manifest, and the manifest contains resources, and those resources are processed against the abstraction layer. But Puppet also contains tools that allow you to interact with your resource abstraction layer directly. So for instance, I'm logged on here as me. I can say Puppet. Source user error. And you'll have to forgive my laptop. It's recording this and doing puppet stuff, so it's going to be slow. Um, miserably slow, apparently. What is it currently doing? So uh, here we go. So what this does is it says, let me interact with the puppet resource abstraction layer, right? And I'm going to ask it about a user resource. And in particular, I'm going to ask it about the user resource called Eric. And so what it's going to dump back 
is a bunch of puppet code that describes exactly what my user looks like on this system. Here's the problem. Some of these things are things that you perhaps don't want to make explicitly set in Puppet, right? For instance, I may not want to explicitly set shell based on what's there. I may want to take the system defaults. Or, you know, I mean, this is Lion, but if I want to take this and clone it onto a CentOS box, <coughs> right, the default settings are going to be different, and some of these may actually break it. If ZSH isn't available, or if the UID isn't available, right? So the problem is, you can go on this thing, and you can actually go and dump, like, host is a good example. Um, you, know, you can go and dump out the contents of all the host resources that are available on your box, and some people will ask, well, can I just take that and, and dump that into a manifest file and use that? You can, right? And it's a start. But the problem is you're, you're, capturing, you're capturing too much information in one way and not enough in another, right? You're capturing certain things that are sort of explicit, like, yeah, all my hosts are Etsy hosts. Thank you, <laughs> right? That's a little too much information. That's something that I want to leave up to the default of a system. If I'm going to port this over to my Windows boxes, Etsy host is wrong, right? So that's one issue. And the other thing is that I'm not capturing enough of the kind of information that sort of specifies things like dependencies and resource ordering and you know, making sure that certain things happen before other things, right? So you can start with something like this, and it will give you a basis to work from, right? You can go in and describe a resource. You can go in and describe an installed package and take those resources and then edit them into something that's useful. But you know, actually doing this is not the greatest practice. Now, there's a tool called Blueprint that's out there um, that you can check out. It's pretty cool. Um, Blueprint will actually let you take a baseline of your server, do stuff to it, and then take another baseline and output the difference in shell, puppet, or chef code, which is really neat. Um, it's still a little bit naive in the same way that this is naive. Right, so it, it can't really capture intent. It does its best. It does a better job than just running Puppet Resource, but it's still not like 100% of the way there. But if you want to take a look at what a model of your system looks like, um, check out Blueprint. Have Blueprint generate a Puppet manifest based on your system. And you'll see, when you look at it, there'll be crazy stuff. Like, you know, it'll have like all your user max password expiration dates in there. You know, it's like, I don't need that. <laughs> You know, it, it will mostly skip your system packages, but sometimes it'll be like, you know, yes, OpenSSL and OpenSSH, thank you. I need one, but not the other. Um, but at the same time, it gives you a starting point. So, you know, I would recommend, you know, grab the Learning Puppet VM, which is available from the docs site, walk through the examples in the Learning Puppet guide, that will get you a good quick start. If you want to go further than that, I would recommend getting a copy of Pro Puppet, which we're, we're going to give away a bunch of copies of in a moment. Um, but Pro Puppet, um, Pro Puppet's awesome. So, you know, disclaimer, my boss wrote it, um, but, but he's awesome too, so that's okay. Um, and the, the really cool thing about Pro Puppet, and they, you know, in typical modest Australian style, he completely fails to tell you this in the book, but if you actually do all the exercises in Pro Puppet, at the end of the book, you have a functional working environment configured in Puppet. Okay, so he gets you doing, you know, DNS and you know, LDAP and all the stuff that you need inside of the book, by the time you're done, you've actually sort of modeled the basic configuration infrastructure, you know, through just the examples in the book while having worked through doing things like writing an external node classifier, writing types and providers, writing functions, writing facts, writing puppet code. So, I mean, that in the long term, right, that's the learning process. In the short term, if you want to get started, just do the learning puppet VM and that stuff, and then start, you know, install puppet on the system and start playing around with it. Right? Start exploring the resources that are installed in your system and get a sense of sort of like, what does this look like? What does this package look like? How would I install this in Puppet? Um, you can also pull down modules from the Forge, um, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, but you can look at modules that other people have written and sort of get a sense of like, how did this guy install my SQL? And then start saying to yourself, what did I not like about it? <laughs> right? Eric, yeah? You guys have just started doing a series on uh, looking at modules on the blog. Really nice. That, that's what I was about to talk about. So um, one of our real problems uh, with Puppet, and one of the problems with, with adoption in Puppet, um, is that our module forge is like, you know, really sucked for a while. And you know, it's a shame that it has, and I, I don't want to say that it's sucked in totality, because there's some really good modules up there, but it just hasn't been you know, as quick as some other tools to be able to say, you know, with Chef, you can go in and just be like, you know, knife install Apache, boom, I've got Apache. Now, you know, I can express my own opinions about, you know, how good that default Apache module is and whether it's going to suit my needs down the line. But 
it's awesome to get started and it's a good like quick learning on ramp. And Puppet thus far has failed to do that mainly because we've sat there and said like, we need to write perfect modules that work in every operating system immediately rather than just sort of getting something that gets you going. One of the focuses of, of the core team has been lately improving the Puppet Forge. And there are a bunch of changes that you're going to see roll out over the next six months, you know, from changes to the Forge software itself, the modules that are contained in there. And as part of that, you know, as the ramp up to that, we're starting to do a Puppet module of the week. Right? So we're going to highlight either a module that we've written or a module that someone else has written in the community. We'd like it to be someone else in the community and not us. Um, but we will start to highlight these modules that meet what we feel is sort of like you know, the best practices and best standards of Puppet module development. One of the key ones that you should look at is the Puppet Lab standard lib module. If you've got Puppet Enterprise, it comes pre-installed. If you've read the learning Puppet VM, it comes pre-installed with it. But it has a whole bunch of really useful things. And aside from being really useful things like you know, uh, 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 defined resources that let you put files together from individual lines. And uh, aside from doing all that, you can poke at the code and get a sense of like, well, how did these guys do that? This is just user code. It's just a module they've installed. So how did they do it? Because I can do the same thing, right? And that also gives you sort of a model to work from. So um, I think that should that should hit. Does that does that answer your question? Great. Hey, Danny, there's there's people up here as well. I don't know. If Thank you. Hi. Um, I've understood Puppet to be about scaling smartly for system administration tests. Um, what's the minimum number of hosts that Puppet, Puppet Paradigm makes sense for interacting with the host? So I should say that I have two Linode instances that I personally run and I manage them through Puppet. And you know, I know that you will all say that I drink the Kool-Aid, right? But, but here's, here's why. Um, after like the fifth time that I had to rebuild one because I decided that I wanted to try like upgrading my operating system, I realized that I was spending a lot of really valuable and expensive time rebuilding my home system. And I, I knew this language that let me automate that, right? We're masochists, we really are. Like, I'll bet most of you, your home systems don't run nearly as well as the systems you have at work, right? Because you tinker on them. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Just because it's one system doesn't mean you shouldn't document it. Right? And just because it's one system doesn't mean it isn't helpful to be able to have that recreated. In fact, if anything, I would say that probably if you're only running like five or six systems, I would make a bet that you're either on your own or maybe have one other person working with you. And so in fact, your time is probably more valuable right, than a team of 15 people who can at least take someone and say, hey, you, you've got a day, fix that server. Right? So my personal feeling is it makes sense to me if I've got one server that I want to be able to reproduce that's complicated. If it's anything more than like, install the OS and drop a package on, um, I will generally puppetize it. Um, we see people all the time that are downloading the Puppet Enterprise, you know, the 10 license free version, and you know, we follow up with them, and they're like, no, no, we've only got eight hosts, like, we're good. Um, and that's, that's okay, like, it's free, have fun. Um, you know, and, and I should actually, just to, to quickly diverge from your point, well, let me ask first, does that, does that answer your question sufficiently? Very well. All right, cool. Simple, no master. Yeah, there, there is a masterless mode, but that's actually not what I was going to hit. I do want to just address the free thing, and then I'll, I'll, I promise I'll circle back to that. Um, th there has been some consternation in the community over the, the licensing changes in Puppet. Um, I guess I'll get a show of hands. Like, how many people here are actually concerned about this issue? <laughs> Somewhere, Brian goes, no, Brian, you're supposed to raise your hand. Brian is deeply concerned about this issue. Um, <laughs> Actually, I was concerned about it as a community member too. Like it, it worried me. Um, what I can tell you is that is that Puppet's idea is not we're not what you would call open core, right? So I would define something like Xenos as open core, where you've got kind of a core product which is then crippled, right? And then you have to pay the enterprise money to get the full product. That's not how Puppet works. Core Puppet um, is fundamentally exactly the same as enterprise Puppet. Our philosophy is that we build layers on top of the enterprise stuff, but it's nothing that you couldn't do, right? So what we're doing is saying, hey, we've got a team of developers and a team of people that understand Puppet really well. We're gonna take the granular tools that any of you can download and mess around with and build something to tie them together and automate their deployment and make looking at them nicer, right? And for a lot of companies, that's worth it. It's worth it for small companies that don't have the time, and it's worth it for big companies that need the automation. Right? But it doesn't replace the open source version, which remains sort of the core driver. And, and sort of like Fedora to Red Hat, you know, continues to sort of push development forward. 
So you know, all the live management slick, awesome stuff that's in you know, uh, Puppet Enterprise 2, and it's gorgeous. If you guys haven't looked at it, you should really check out live management because it's beautiful. But I, it, seriously, it was like a jaw-dropping moment when I saw it. But at the same time, um, that's based on M Collective, which is a tool that I was using before Puppet even bought it. Um, and all of the things that you can do with live management, I was doing with the open source M Collective you know, a year and a half ago. Right? So yes, we make it pretty. And yes, if you're a big company or a very small company, you know, in either circumstance, it, it's probably of some benefit to you. But a lot of times when we go to our biggest enterprise customers, when we bring them PE, they show us, oh, that's funny, we just did that. And they show us you know, that their team of developers has gone and stitched the same thing together. So you know, PE is not about replacing that stuff. Yes? Oh, look, but it's so pretty. Yeah, I went on a keynote, that's fine. Uh, so in any event, you know, don't, don't sweat the PE versus FOSS difference. We fully support FOSS. We actually have a separate FOSS team. We love open source. Open source is the core of our community. Luke is, is a dedicated open source guy. Um, I'm a dedicated open source guy. There are people in the company who would leave rather than see something bad happen with Puppet. So you know, I, I think you know, don't worry about that stuff. I, it's easy for me to say, but there you have it. Uh, any more questions? You had one that you were, you were just mad you were raising, which is a second. I was just going to suggest that it's the you know, smallest number. You can run it on one computer without a master. Yeah, you can run masterless Puppet. Um, you don't have to use a Puppet Master. You can run it in standalone mode. And even more interestingly, perhaps, than standalone mode, one of the things that we've been trying to, uh, to really push forward with uh, is that you can compile and execute catalogs. You can now sort of put a separation in that state, right? So you can tell your Puppet Master, compile a catalog. But don't ship it back to the client and execute it. Just give it to me, right? So what we see a lot of is very, very large compute clusters, right? Where you have just this phenomenal number of nodes. You'll have a dedicated cluster of puppet, you know, uh, puppet compilation machines that are sitting there cranking out manifests, and then you can distribute those right out to your systems and execute them offline at a later time. Um, a very large company that shall go unnamed for the moment uh, uses does this with their laptops. Right? So they have a, a read-only partition. Um, they have a partition. Surmise what you like. They have a partition on their Macs um, that contains the, uh, their, you know, the latest version of their Puppet Manifests. Right? And when they're on the corporate network, uh, they go ahead and connect to the Puppet Master and grab the latest copy. But when you're in an airplane and you pop the thing open, right, it just says, oh, I don't have a Puppet Master. OK, I'm going to execute Puppet against the latest copy of my local catalog. So this is a way that this company is able to actually keep their laptops up to date using Puppet, using master Puppet, right? But still function when it's offline. And this gives you lots of flexibility. Um, more questions? What's the highest number of nodes that a single Puppet master can handle? Uh, so it's a slippery question because it depends on the number of resources and how big the master is, right? So. Um, but I would say that on average, you will see that you know one to two thousand nodes per puppet master is about as good as you can squeeze out, unless you've really got like a you know thirty-two processor insane you know giant Unisys box. Um, you know, a general puppet master can handle between one to two thousand nodes tuned normally. Um, I think I pushed mine at my last gig. I think I pushed it up to like fifteen hundred on a you know off of a VM, and and then I started seeing like you know I actually. I hit I.O. contention, which like in, in all the time since then, and all the companies that I've visited working for Puppet, I have never seen that happen since. But I hit I.O. contention. Um, but you know, generally, once you start getting to that size, you at the very least want a cluster, right? At the very least for just high availability, if nothing else, and, and redundancy. So you know, but yeah, you can, you can definitely run 1,000 off a single one. That's what PE is tuned for by default. Any more? Oh, you're getting good. Nobody else? Ah, there you go. Hello. This is more of a question of um, when you're actually using Puppet. So um, you had the exec slide up there, and I was going to just talk on that for a second. How can you give Puppet a uh, expectation of a different return value for an exec command? Uh, there is actually, so this is not a complete list, 
uh, of all the stuff that you can do with exec. Uh, going back to this for a sec, if I do puppet describe exec, and after my computer decides a year and a half to figure it out, um, this is the same documentation. Now you can get this off the docs.puppetlabs.com website. If you go to, the, there's a page called generated, uh, generated references. Uh, this is the type guide, right? But you can get information about a type from the command line by just doing puppet describe and the type. Uh, so in this case, there is a, a particular uh, attribute. Uh, uh, let's see, I believe it's returns, but I just want to make sure that I'm right about that. Uh, yeah, there it is at the top. Uh, so it lets you specify the expected return code or an array of acceptable return codes. So you can say, you know, zero is fine, but also if you're returning 244, because I know, yeah, that's cool. Okay, yeah, I, I missed that one several times after looking at the documentation, so thanks. Yeah, that's the one. Pu than... Puppet describe is awesome. Can, can you specify more than one? Yeah, yeah, you can pass it an array. Um, so you definitely can. And, and by the way, if you write your own code in, with Puppet doc compatible oh, right. documents, uh, with, uh, d uh, rather comments, and the, the style guide on the site, oh, I should have mentioned this. Please use the style guide. The style guide is awesome. It will help you. You can use Puppet Lint to check against the style guide, right? It's a linter for Puppet code. Um, but uh, if you take a look, um, basically, uh, if you write your, your comments in the Puppet doc format, uh, you can generate this documentation for your own modules and manifests. And there's even a, a, a gem floating around there somewhere that will basically build an HTML tree on your Puppet Enterprise server that will go and just host all of the documentation for the manifests and modules that you've written, which is incredibly awesome to have, and it just auto-generates that every time there's a change. More questions? Ah, Sunny. Do you have any slides on puppet faces? I don't have slides on puppet faces, but I can talk about puppet faces. Um, that, was, that was one of those, like, hey, we really needed a marketing team, which we now have moments. Because we, we, we said, yeah, puppet faces are awesome, and then failed to tell anybody what they were. Puppet faces are really awesome. Um, so the, the problem before Puppet Faces was that, you know, in order to extend Puppet, you needed to understand a great deal of the internal Puppet infrastructure. You really needed to, to grok a lot of code and talk to the developers a lot and be on Puppet Dev and read a lot about, you know, undocumented stuff about the indirector and all that stuff. And the idea was, well, wait a minute, you know, we, we really are trying to build a service-oriented architecture here, right? And we've implemented this nice REST API and we've moved away from XML RPC. Um, why don't we make available like a subset of our API that's really easy to write to and very well documented that lets people do like 99% of what they want to do with Puppet? So that was the genesis of Faces. Uh, then we sort of thought, well, you know, how do we get people excited about this and interested in it, and how do we prove that it actually does what it is that we say it does, which is sort of the mantra of Puppet, right? And we do tend to eat our own dog food a lot. So in this particular circumstance, what we did was we went and re-implemented every single major puppet command as a face. So if, for those of you that were around in like 025 days, like in, and prior, um, we used to have Puppet D and Puppet uh, and Roush, right, and all these standalone tools. And now you have Puppet Cert, Puppet Apply, Puppet Agent, Puppet Master. Every single one of those is a face. It uses the Faces API, which is a limited version of the interface to use REST to communicate with the puppet, you know, the local puppet uh, environment and actually get stuff done. So basically, you know, getting started with faces, I would take a look at some of the existing ones, which, you know, as I said, we're distributing current code as faces. Um, but there's some more that you can download off the site. They're incredibly easy to do. As part of the developer course, actually, I do have something I can pull up for you. Um, as part of the developer course, let's see if I have it here. Ooh, I don't have the developer course here. One more place, like, look. Nope. Ah, yes, I do. Uh, no, I don't have it here. Sorry. Um, you basically re implement Puppet Agent in four commands, right? And you do that through the Faces API. So it's incredibly powerful. And you basically do it by saying, you know, evaluate facts, okay. Take the facts, you know, evaluate manifests, call functions, build catalog, return catalog. And it's like that level of stupid simple. Um, but you can also extend it to do other stuff. So if you take a look at, uh, at Cloud Provisioner, which is what we have, uh, it's part of Puppet Enterprise. It's actually open source, 
but bits of it, um, the extensions you have to get with Puppet Enterprise. So you can use Puppet Cloud Provisioner as a platform and build your own, or you can use PE and get the ones that we've built for you. Um, but you can use that to automatically deploy like EC2 or vCenter nodes, and we're, we're adding providers all the time. Um, but that's a face. That uses the Puppet face, and it also goes ahead and interacts with the, the uh, Amazon API right, to go ahead and provision those nodes and then use the face to move them into the right categories. So that, does that give you sort of an idea of, of what it does and how flexible it is? Yeah? Yeah. Well, I've seen it before. It's great. I was asking for their first. Yeah, yeah. Faces are awesome. Play with them. I love the EC2 provisioner. They're cool. More questions? We are starting to lose people in the back. Part of me thinks that we should move to, to trivia. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, not having been alerted to the fact that I was going to have to do trivia prior to this exercise, and given the fact that I've actually been like blabbing my mouth off for the last hour or so, I don't have a lot of great trivia questions, so I'm going to have to cook some up. Uh, so I guess I would say, um, and actually, what are, what, are, what are our prizes for, for correct trivia answers? Do we have, I know I was giving away 10, 10 pro puppets, do we have anything else, or? Marie O'Reilly. Sunny? Okay, so, wow, that's 13. That's a lot of stuff. That's pretty good. I don't know if I can come up with 13 questions. Anybody else want to come up with some questions? Um, I'll give books to people that come up with questions. Um, yeah. So if you guys... Um, well, I'll ask an easy one. Uh, so, uh, let's say, who can identify the date of the very first commit to Puppet? <coughs> Go for it. The day after a box SSH loop. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right, that gets an honorary yes. <laughs> um, so, the way this is going to work is. Um, we're, we'll distribute these. I'll, I'll actually get these sent out to you guys. So uh, Sunny will we'll pass out an index card to the people that, that get them and you yes. know, give them give them back to to Sunny or Brian. Um, they'll get the stuff to me. On this? If you have a pen, you should use that. This is a giant sharp piece that work. Uh, do you need a pen? I need a pen. Here and write your name and make sure you get it back to either me or him. Yeah, and some form that I can get in touch with you so that I can or or your mailing address would be preferable so that I can have the book sent you know pretty easily. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Without looking at your laptop, so this disqualifies anybody with a laptop or an iPad sitting in front of them. Uh, who can? Who knows about the changes in scoping and variable scoping that are coming for, or that are there for two seven, and can talk about you know, sort of what the what the pertinent. Give me, give me two salient points. Okay, you guys seriously need to read the variable scoping page. Okay, cool. Yeah, go for it. Um, I think you got to specify the full class name for variables that you want to access right. from other uh, modules. So no more dynamic scoping. Yeah. And I, that's okay. all I got. That's all you got. <laughs> what do you and, got? And global scope has to be explicit. Ah, that's kind of what he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're you're close. You want to you want to take a crack based on that answer? Oh, so close. Think global. I'm tempted to just give it to you anyway. Because I really don't have that many questions. Um, so this is actually really, this is, this is good. It's like informative and fun at the same time, right? So uh, it's like watching PBS. The, uh, uh, the answer is that, that, you know, yes, dynamic scoping is going away because dynamic, dynamic scoping is full of evil. Um, if you do not know this, go and take a look at the scoping page on the Puppet, the Docs, the Puppet website. There is a page on variables and scoping. Please read it. If you are getting messages out of your Puppet Master that say, this is deprecated, you know, and it's like in yellow, this is like the next thing that we can do short of having Luke come to your home and hit you on the head with a hammer. Like, please pay attention to the this is deprecated, don't do it anymore notices because we're really nice and we don't deprecate when we say we're going to, but one day we will and there will be tears and sadness. 
Um, so variable scoping, uh, dynamic scoping is going away because it was a bad idea in the first place. Everything needs to be explicitly scoped, which means facts should be referred to as you know dollar sign colon colon fact name. Um, so uh, and that's to make your life more sane. And the, the flip side of that and the real reason behind that is that you know global variables are going away. And anybody here that's worked with PHP should just know why that is. Global variables are going away. There will be a top scope, which facts are set at that you can access, that sort of act like globals, but they avoid the problem of being able to override top scope variables locally, which is really the problem, right? Right now I can go set operating system at the top, at, at the global level, and then locally I can say operating system equals blah, and I've now clobbered my operating system fact. So that's a bad thing. So having explicit scoping in variables allows us to say that's not going to happen anymore. Um, okay. Uh, release date of Puppet Enterprise 1.0. These are really, that's a terrible question. I don't even think I'm going to ask people to answer that question, unless somebody knows it. I don't even know it. I know. I don't know it either, but I've got Google here. <laughs> Bring Google headquarters. Surely we can find the answer. Um, Okay, we'll skip that. I get, I get bad points for that. Oh, God, I need help coming up with these questions. Um, I got a question. Good, thank you. Well, you can approve it or not. What is the basic unit of things you work with in Puppet? Some, you can reword that. You know, you know what I'm getting at, right? You mean like, you know, like sort of what is the atomic element in Puppet? Like what is the smallest level on which you work in a, you know? Well, I'll tell you the answer I'm getting. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, okay. So, so okay, I can reword that a little bit. Um, yeah. Most of what you work with in Puppet, right, when you're actually checking the state of something, right, against something else and maybe changing it, what is that something called? The source. Resource. Well, now that you all shout, that's like three people shouted it, and I don't know who was first. I think Matthew was first, actually. I didn't actually say anything, and I have all <laughs> That, well, that really doesn't do a lot for my reliability. <laughs> who, who would Someone like that there? Said it. Yeah. Who said it back that way? You said it back that way? You win. <laughs> this is like, you know. This is pathetic. Um, I, I have no good questions. Yeah, that's a good question. You can ask like a really noob question. This is for the noob, so if you're like good with puppet. Noob no questions. Way. Oh, awesome. You, you um, gave the answer way earlier. Yeah. What do That's you call the puppet node that has all the manifests that everyone hits up? Ah, that's it's a good a real one. new question. Ooh, uh, master? That's a great one. I'm in the master. master. Yeah. Sorry? The master? Incorrect. The puppet. Mm -hmm. uh, unless that is what you were looking for. That was. That was. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you meant something else. Um, so I'll ask the question I thought you meant. Uh, what what do you call a node? Well, you and you won that one because you, you said master. Um, but the follow up is, uh, what do you call a? Uh, how do you define a node in Puppet, um, where if no node is actually defined, you fall through and get these values? What is that node called? Yes. Default. Yes. I'll get you next if you know it. <laughs> default is correct. So you can do a node default, right? And if you put stuff in there, if you don't have a node definition, right default will actually happen. That's really good for making sure your like SSH config actually happens. Uh, okay. Um, more puppet questions. What is Ah, good one. Please. Skywalker. You win for pronunciation, and because I didn't, I didn't get you on the last one. <laughs> yes, it's Kenise. Yes, I mispronounced it the first time I talked to him. Who wins? Sorry. Uh, he does. Seriously? And you won one also. Kanice, oh, yes. I've been saying it to oh, Gaines for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, have you said that to his face? Probably not. <laughs> he's, he's really polite about it when you do. Oh, this is another, another personal loop question. I'm sure he'll just be weirded out by this whole thing. So he's not going to find out about this. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, wait, no. How I should, many kids? I should. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. How many kids does Luke have? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? To Mitch? Mitch gets one. Okay. How many we got left? Uh, well, I disqualified Dave because I work with him. <laughs> That's uh, the meanest to realize, to listen to this. Who I work with Mitch. <laughs> wait, who, who won? Mitch won. Okay. Hey. 
Yeah, for you guys that don't know, um, two of the people that shouted out recently, um, the guy in the blue back there that said, I even don't know that. Um, so, uh, so this is one of our, uh, our professional service engineers, Ryan Coleman. Um, he's actually in town. He just did the New York City master training. Um, so I think, are you still the newest one on the team, or is there someone newer now? Well, no, not nearly. For PSE, we've had three. <laughs> other employees, we've had the 15. It's insane. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so Ryan is awesome and, and filled with goodness. Are you in New York? Ah, that's a good one. Are you in New York? Nobody knows that. No, Even I would have to look that up. That's a fair point. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, uh, definitely Ryan, and Ryan actually hails from, I think you hail from the Pennsylvania area. Yeah. So uh, ideally we'll be seeing a lot more of him in the neighborhood lately. Um, you can certainly, um, you know, either of us you can hit up with puppet questions, although he, he's flying to India tomorrow, so be gentle. Um, <laughs> and, and Mitch, uh, Mitch Sonys, did I pronounce that right, Mitch? Um, Mitch works for uh, Cloudhammer, uh, which is a company that, that does integration products uh, really around Puppet, and they've got this, this amazingly cool product called Stathammer that probably Mitch doesn't want me to talk about this loudly yet, but um, it's a really interesting tool for assembling stacks of Puppet modules visually and interacting with EC2. So um, definitely a product to take a look at, good company, good people. Do um, you have any, any good trivia questions on the up here? Thank you. Please, a lot of softballs for me. I'm out. We'll call back to your stuff. All right. Yeah, do it. Here. All right. Uh, so, yeah. You guys hear me back there? Oh, okay, now I can hear myself. Uh, where can you get examples of modules that are already written? The Forge. Puppet Forge. All right, so that's forge.puppetlabs.com. You get a, what are we Ooh. giving away? Uh, Crow Puppet copies. I got one. I, I got a microphone. Okay. You got this? In the red back here? Oh, Jeremy. Is there another site out there um, that has a set of modules that you can download uh, other than Forge? GitHub. That's, that's true, but it's not the one that I'm looking for, so you don't know. Yes? I'm sorry? Rise Up has a lot of Do they really? Oh. I'm not familiar with Rise Up. I think Mike Anderson? Really? Yeah. Wow. I've learned something. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, based, based on the number of people that agree with this, you're getting one. I was actually thinking of example 42. Um, and, and with example 42, by the way, their old modules were not really compliant with like the right way of doing it. Uh, they since worked with Ken Barber, our London PSE, uh, to, to put together a better, basically, version two of their modules. And their version two modules are awesome. If you want an example of how to write good Puppet modules, look at the example 42 stuff. Just make sure it's the version two modules and not the... I would say this happened about a month ago. Um, and it's still not all of them. If you, if you go to their site, it, it'll say, you know, like these are the version two versus version one. Um, but yeah, their, their stuff is awesome. There is actually a, a blog post by Tim Sharp from GitHub called Stop Writing Puppet Modules That Suck. Um, highly recommended because it's actually good advice for stopping writing puppet modules that suck. No, no. Do you have any more? Oh, you're here to bail me out, man. <laughs> Yeah, do it. New questions. Okay. Um, so when you write your first puppet manifest, this is for noobs. What is the extension of that file? That's not bad. Yes. Yes. Is that any, does anybody know what .pp stands for? I don't know. Actually, no, none, of, none of us know. <laughs> Even Luke told me the other day that he has no idea why we named it .pp. Yeah, I guess. What's the answer? <laughs> That's the thing. Oh, really? Yeah. So I've got, I've, I've got. Do we have? Are we all out of cards? Because I got, I got one other good no, one. No, we have like four more or something. Oh, okay. It's um, never ending. How do you get to the Easter egg in Puppet? Puppet, help, 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 help. Well, it's at least you five, said right? it. You, what you've said in, in, includes is the, the superset. <laughs> it's just five. It's just uh, four times. Puppet, help, 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 help. Okay. Um, and yeah, if you exercise it, there's uh, before you do it five times. Just uh, uh, do it. Do it. Do it. Uh, do it once first, right? So puppet help gives you puppet help, right? And then if you want help on puppet help, you actually have to type puppet help help, or I believe it's puppet help help help, right? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. puppet help help help, and and that's really intuitive. That gives you information about the puppet help help command, right? <laughs> and so we kind of figured if you take that out of this logical extension and say puppet help 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 help, 
Alright, this is it. This is the payoff. You probably need a break. That's the key. Got any more? We're down to four. You can ask them to call out resource things. That's even lame for me. I've got nothing. I know. It's like, they spread this on me at the last possible moment. Um, Name three or four resource, three resource sites at the same time. Yeah, okay. I guess just one more. No, no, no. I'm, I don't mean to complain so much. I'm just complaining. Ah, yeah, yes. Uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave this first, then you get yours. Uh, uh, three, three resource types. Go for it. Five. 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 Go for it. Five tools and user. Sorry, what, what was the third one? File host and application. Uh, package third host one. user. Yes. Package host user. Who, who actually just said package host user? You did. Congratulations. Um, so, what's what's the date of Puppet Camp in New York City? April twenty seventh. Yeah. It, yeah. Very nice. That. Uh, by the way, Puppet Camp is always worth going to. Um, my boss, James Turnbull, will be there. I will be there. Kelsey Hightower from uh, from Atlanta is one of our core developers, and actually the guy. The guy that's working on the on the forge stuff will be there. Um, probably a lot of other people will be there because people use the excuse to come to New York. It's, it's kind of amusing. Um, it is free, uh, which is which is most very awesome. And and I will tell you that you know if if you guys have not had the experience of of going and and hearing the puppet people talk, and I, I'm not talking about me. <laughs> I talk about the people that actually like like developed this. It's amazing. Like I, I mean, I think. It's, it's basically the reason that I joined up. You get to know these people. You get to know James and Nigel and Luke and people like that. And it is truly impressive, like, just the quality of people that we've got working. And Kelsey, in particular, is... Kelsey's actually responsible for the new iteration of the Module Forge. Um, so if you go to Puppet Camp, you'll have an opportunity to ask the guy who's writing the new stuff and actually talk to him about, you know, if you have ideas or concerns or anything, I'm, I'm sure he'll be happy. He'll hate me for volunteering him for this, but um, he'll be more than happy to talk about it. And... and uh, it's definitely worth going to. I would, I would really, make, you know, make a point of trying to attend, especially because it's free. You get free stuff. Wait, Will somebody won something, but I don't know who. Never cut out the date over a year. Wait, we should make that the last one. <laughs> who won the last prize? <laughs> <laughs> Was it one of you guys that called it out? So they, they called who called out the date of the public? Yeah, I'm sorry. It was oh, you already won. <laughs> You wasted a question. I don't think I made that no double winner disclaimer, but what are you going to do with two copies of Pro Puppet? No, these, no, these are stack them up. These are different. These are uh, free books, for, free one free PDF book from O'Reilly. That's actually yeah. pretty nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, were all these things you just said about Puppet Camp applicable to Europe as well? Uh, I don't know if Puppet Camp Europe is free. Um, I no, I mean like who will be there? No, uh, so it's always different people, right, depending on where you are. Puppet Camp Europe, I would expect to at the very least see, you know, Ken Barber, who's the senior PSC in London. Uh, you would expect to see Ari Pinar, who, for those who don't know who Ari Pinar is, uh, ah, good, <laughs> uh, uh, he runs devco.net, which is, which is Ari's blog, which if you haven't read it, is, is truly awesome, just because Ari, like, percolates for three months, gets really irritated about something, Asked a lot of really prickly questions. He's Volcane in IRC, if you, if you guys have received. Probably everybody in this room that's been in the IRC uh, in Pound Puppet has gotten help from him. But he'll sit there and simmer for like three months, and then like out of his brain will explode Hyra or M Collective or something like that. It's, it's just. EXT Lookup, too. Yeah, EXT Lookup, which he hates himself for. It's really, it's just like, you know, it's awesome to watch him recursively hate. Um, yeah, go for it. No, no, that was, I was going to ask. You already talked about what you have, right? He was yeah. going to ask what Ari wrote. Actually, Why yeah, that's actually, I think, still a valid question. Yeah. Like, who's still paying attention after an hour? <laughs> <laughs> name, name three projects that Ari Pinar wrote for Puppet. No, you don't get to do it. You already won. I didn't. You didn't win already? No. no. I gave it away. You gave it away? No, I, yeah. I called, you were, okay. someone else had answered. Name Tyra, M Collective, and uh, EXT Lookup. Lookup. There you go. You Come on, this is like a something. rigged game. You guys could win anything. Are, are we this lethargic? I wasn't Have I been this boring? Are you all just asleep? <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is that we write awesome software. The bad news is we suck at trivia questions. So. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks for bearing with us. Ooh, brilliant. And it's on the next slide, too. So like I can just do the reveal. Is this, is this our last card, too? No, we have two. 
I got. I'm going to save that for the last card. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, um, this could be kind of cruel. Uh, yeah. Okay. Name name three members of Puppet's executive team. It is, it, is, it is until you think about it. Like, you know, just think about prominent puppet community members and then think about ones that are capable of managing things. So, <laughs> just where are we based? Ah, there you go. Oh, you got one. Somebody who hasn't won, where are we based? James. Would be a one your career side earlier? Uh, <laughs> right? Portland? Yeah. I got it. All right, sorry. And the very, very last one. Well, there was a follow up to that. Portland, uh, come check it out if you're ever in the area. Oh, yes. Look us up. Portland is awesome, so I gotta plug it. I did move from central Pennsylvania to Portland, fell in love instantly. So Portland Portland is what the village used to be. Except it's it's overly white and there's too many bike riders, but other than that, um <laughs> it wants to be like the village used to be. It's 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 um Portland has changed a lot in the last 10 years. If you haven't been there recently, it has changed a lot as a city. And it has become a really cool city. And if you go there for no other reason than Powell's Technical Bookstore, um, seriously, guys, it's an entire bookstore. It's like Powell's itself is massive and amazing, but then Powell's Technical Bookstore is just this entire bookstore filled with just every technical book you could possibly want. And like signed copies of them. And like, and you know, Apple leases sitting on top of the book. Oh. <laughs> All right, so the very last question. Um, where are we going for beer? <laughs> yes, wineries. So the answer to that question is not exact. Damn it. So I'm led to believe this is a long standing NY Lug drug, but it tells you exactly how many NY Lug meetings I actually managed to attend. Um, I'm a bad, bad community member. I'm trying to be better. Um, but isn't it why you came anyway? So we're at Flannery's, uh, 205 West 14th Street. It's the corner of 14th and 7th. Um, I'll be there for a while. I'm not going to stay that long, but I will be there for at least half an hour or so. Um, and certainly lots of other interesting people that are probably more fun to listen to gab to than uh, will be. So uh, let's head out over there. And uh, thank you. Thank you.